This week's episode is sponsored by Change. Change is an online mentoring program that teaches people with no experience how to create a real profitable online business and e-commerce. I have been working with Ryan at Change for a few years now and attended many events and got to meet the amazing community of like-minded people. These guys are the best of the best. The support these guys offer is personal, no bots or employees, there's no experience needed, but like anything in life, it takes time as it's a real business with real results. For more information, go check out Ryan on Instagram at RyanJB and he will guide you through the steps to help build a successful business. You can now follow me on all my social media platforms to find out who my latest guest will be. And don't forget to click the subscribe button and the notifications bell so you're notified for when my next podcast goes live. And he just put his, he put his tea towel over his arm, right? Got the blade. I mean, let's go downstairs. And I'm thinking to myself, oh, mate, I've been here two days, this guy's now going to go and stab someone at death. Always the possibility of him calling me an informer. Because I've heard him say it so many times about people. So for me to think he wouldn't say it about me was a bit naive. So I've got Nick for in 94 from a lorry load of, well, they found half a ton of cannabis on a lorry. And me and my mate got nicked for that. They're on me, about a mile and a half chasing me. I've got the gun down my waist. What am I going to do with this gun? Did he die of age? Because when I come out of prison in 83, my intent was to kill him. And the first thing I've done, I went around to someone's house, I said, where's he fucking live now? Been getting followed by these Eastern Europeans. I don't know what they're fucking up, so I think they're going to wrap me up. Even though he shot you, he's turned your life upside down at that moment and fucking suicidal mode. Shit that's been said to you. If he rang you up right now and says, I'm sorry, what would you do? That would do. That would do. Sometimes the man you take a bullet for ends up being the one behind the gun. And boom, we're on. And today's guest with Big Paul Tierney in, Paul. Hello, mate. How are you, nice my brother? Good, mate. Nice to see you. Nice to see you again. First time we've done an interview, what, three years ago now? Three years, yeah. How's the response been? I was surprised at the amount of views it got, even though that weren't my motive, but the amount of people that reached out to me afterwards and saying to me, Paul, where's your head at? No one thinks that of you. He says that about everybody. So, no, take no notice. No one else has took notice. And it gave me a good... It made me feel better about myself. It made me believe, Paul, no one does believe it, but my ego wouldn't believe it. My ego wouldn't let it go. And it, but it was a good, I think I made a good decision doing that with you last time. Because I know you were sceptical. Yeah, it's no right. secret, listen, Pat Adams shot you, <laughs> ended up in prison, you two of were best friends. You kind of felt let down by it. He's been calling your names before that, after that, it's escalated, but like I say, time goes on and how have you been dealing with it all now? The 10 years of it has been like a, a life sentence because I've tried to work out how things got that bad. How could, how could things deteriorate that quick? One minute I'm 50, we're at my birthday, we're all right, everything's fine. And within three months, as I said before, I'm a smack dealer. I'm an informer, I'm a grass. I'm, I'm all these things that he knows of any man on this planet are not true. And for him to take any notice of it, I couldn't, couldn't accept that. I couldn't comprehend that you would even use these words to describe a man 
that's been there for you for 25 years and never let you down, or your son, or your family, to be honest. How did it get so messy then? As I said before, I think it was... I think a lot of it was, I said, to do his son. His son was more... How can I say it? He was younger. When I first I looked after his son, I protected his son. I looked after him, I had his back at every turn. And I think where Pat weren't here, and I was looking after his son, there's it, a little bit of, not jealousy is the wrong word, but I suppose the, me and the boy got too close. But then when certain things started to evolve, which I won't go into detail, when certain things started to come out that weren't true, and I went and dug and found out the truth, his son's got two options. Who's he scared of the most? It's going to be his dad. And his dad's going to believe his son. But the bit that, this, that did surprise me, when I went and put the note on his door, I put the note on his door for one reason. He wouldn't come and see me. He kept promising, let's sort this out, let's sort this bollocks out. And he didn't. So I put the note on his door saying, right, this is a year before this even happened, saying, ask your son to tell the truth. I didn't even say that. I said, ask G to tell the truth. I thought he would have come to me with his boy and had it out on the table. Who's telling the truth here? I just didn't get to say. But they kept the, mo mo the note for another year, which brought the word grass into the case. I used the word grass originally on the letter. And the only reason it got used is because that's what was quoted in court, which... I've actually created that problem myself and the newspapers destroyed it, but it's just so, it's, I find it very sad because I put the man on a pedestal and as I said, I've, I, it, it, it absolutely broke me, but I fought through it. It's been hard. I've had support from quite a few people I didn't used to listen to him because my head was gone. But now I've had therapy. I've learned to distinguish situations. It's like I've been a grieving process. That's what it's been. But I don't want to demean the word grieving for people that have lost family members and things like that because I've seen what that does to people and a broken heart. It felt like that. But now I've, I've, I've unraveled it. I've addressed a lot of my own issues needing to be part of people, needing to be part of something. And I'm in the best place I've been probably in my whole life. I never thought I'd be happy again, but I am. Yeah, that's amazing. Cause I remember when I first had you on, you were quite nervous. You kept touching your throat. Mm. You were unsure whether to do that interview or not, but you had so much questions. You had so many, you wanted answers as well. So many things hanging over your head. It was like a, a dark cloud of just fucking pain you were in trying to do the right thing being called a grass, you, you'd been in out of prison, you would die for certain people, and then to be getting through under the bus and then shot as well, that's a lot to fucking deal with. How's therapy been for you? How was it actually going to therapy and speaking for the first time? It, it was a relief, because I could be open. Could you trust them? Because I've been to therapy and I struggled to... I've had a few therapists in the past, to when I was dealing with the drugs and, and getting over the drug situation. But this time, I just thought, right, I'm not going to give them no gory details about anything. I'm giving them the gist about, I want to know why I'm, why did I nail my, my flag to his, to his mask, you know what I mean? What was so, and, it, and it, it just, it all unraveled that it was low self-esteem, no confidence, low self-worth. And when someone does something for you, I realised, listen, I, I never had, I didn't have no money, I didn't have nothing, right? I had my own, took my hand around my neck. I'd done my own, my own business. And Pat, Pat gave me an opportunity one day, and he gave, he gave me something. And what he gave me, I didn't feel that I was worth that for what I'd done. And it, I found it very hard to accept, and I just, I didn't want it, but I took it and put it somewhere and left it there for ages and ages. And that happened a couple of times. And the only way I could feel that I, 
to repay him, or I didn't have to repay him, but I felt that I had to repay him with my loyalty. And when he wasn't here, his son was here for 15 years on his own. I look after his son. In, so I never felt worth it. But this woman explained it to me. She went, look, this is, this is just from your childhood. This is how you've been brought up. You never had no confidence. You never had no self-worth. So you never thought you was any good. I admit, listen, James, I didn't talk about it last time, but I've had to talk about these things with her. And I've got no, I carried a lot of shame around with me for years, right? I weren't going to mention it today, but I'm an open book and I'll throw it on the table. I got messed about with when I was seven, right? Never told anyone until I was 46. And that was in a rehab, right? It come out of it. And then it happened again when I was 14. And that one, I held on to. And it, it was so hard because there was three other people in the room at the time when it happened. And I froze. I literally froze. I couldn't shout. I couldn't say anything because I was seven again. It was a seven-year-old being attempted to be molested again. And, but now I'm 14. And it just, it crucified me. So these are all things that was buried deep in me that have now come out. And when I come out of the hospital, I called my two, who well, our class is probably my best friends at the time from school. And I called them around and I told them, I said, look, I've got something to tell you. And I'm waiting for this. I don't know what I'm waiting for. But when I told them, they went, yeah, he was always a dodgy fucking man, wasn't he? I thought, was that it? There was no criticism. There was no, oh, why didn't you scream? Or that? They just let, and so all them years I went onto that nonsense for nothing. I could have let that, I could have let that go. But yeah, it was, um, the therapy has been an help. Has been a big help. Yeah, just and want to say proud of you for that. Yeah. That's not easy. And I've been speaking about him so frequently, but Jeff Thompson, he's an eighth man. Correct, Absolute man. killer. Fucking killer. I had him on a podcast, abused by his instructor when he was 11, 12. And this man just fueled himself with absolute hate and vengeance and rage. He called it the parasite. The parasite he just grew Eacher. bigger and bigger and bigger because he never spoke about it. And I've had enough survivors on it takes years and years and years but it eats away at them and it's so hard for people to come forward but jeff ended up seeing his abuser in a like a cafe many years later now he's an eighth dan he always visualized killing him yeah. obviously as he got older he tried to calm be calm and he was a bouncer and an absolute killer then he, he learned how to master it but he's seen this man in the cafe his abuser eighth dan seen him what did he do froze didn't know what to do. He seemed, he went back to being 11, 12 year old again exactly and right. froze. And he tried, he didn't know what to do. His head just went. So it doesn't matter who you are. You could be the biggest killer on the planet or the nicest and soft people, person on the planet. There's everybody reacts to trauma differently. And he's prime example. It doesn't matter who you are. Everybody's mm. still got that in them. But what he did, he, he did approach the guy and says to him what he'd done. The, the man broke down and then Jeff feels as if he got his power back. So you even speaking to the therapist, You've then got your power back. That's strength. That's like strength. I, I hear these stories so frequently. And my job is, I used to interview gangsters. Everybody knew that. Mm. But then you start interviewing one person and they're exposing s certain things. Then other people come forward. That yep. gives other people strength. Exactly. It's so dark doing s certain stories. But my job now is to try and shed light on the things that nobody else goes to. Mm. So for you even doing that. Now, three years, what we've been very good contact. We've always... Mm praising each other we're always the odd phone call we've always been there the last three years yeah. and obviously there's something about yourself Paul where you can see the honesty you can also see the vulnerability and going through those stages in life as well then there's going to be that element of control mm. so he's had your control the power not just the abuser but your, your friend course, basically yes. and that's course, where because yes. you're wanting that love and attention how was it speaking about it to the therapist for the first time what the, the abuse thing yeah it was a relief it was really a relief. It was like, because I said, I've spoke to my, I spoke to my friends, I spoke about the first time it happened, I spoke to about it in the rehab, but not, the one I found, the one that affected me the most was when I was 14. That seemed to affect me, but I think because I felt 
I should have, I should have screamed. I should have fought. I should have done, done something. Never. But once I explained it, she went, yeah, but the trauma has took you straight back to when you was a kid and it happened. And it's exactly what did happen. And I've even unraveled a little bit. A lot of people go at me, what's the matter with you when you have a cuddle? You, you, you go stiff. Well, now you fucking know. Because it's, it's an intimate it's an intimate thing. I still find it hard to cuddle my own kids. That's, that's really sad. That's really sad for them and for me. I find it very uncomfortable. And they go, it's all right, Dad, we know. And I love them, but I just don't have that. This, this is one thing I've still not got round. I don't know why. But that takes time. Remember all the shit that you've I'm been through? I'm 61. I know, but all, you're only just coming to acceptance of your life. Everything you've been through, the abuse, prisons, being shot, being called certain things. And th this is you only coming, this is all coming to our head where it becomes a release. Three years ago, I believe it was the start of your new yeah, chapter for your new journey and going, wait a minute, I, people do actually like me. People don't actually think that. Mm. Because when you know when people throw mud, it's, it's horrible sometimes. Sometimes as men, we've got to defend, we've got to fucking stand. Listen, anybody ever came forward to me, I don't give a fuck who they are. I would always step forward. And that's exactly. not to act tough. Like, that's always been it's the case me. from yeah. who I've been. Like, I it's always it. respect people, I always show respect. I always give love if people see me in the street. They will always, I'll always show them a smile and go, how are you doing? I'll always give the time of day and talk. Oh, it's always been, but when people try and tarnish your name and people, if people are bold enough to tarnish your name, you've got to be bold enough to fight for it. So when you're going through all that, that's just a big negative bubble. And then when it actually pops, everything starts coming to the surface where you start realising who you were, what you've done, because you've been no saint either. You've done a lot of bad Sorry. shit as well. So yeah. it's going to affect you. And we'll always be dealing with trauma to the day we die. As soon as you first feel that hard bit of trauma, it's always, it always stays there. Yeah. Even if I'm having a good day, Something will pop into my mind and go, remember you done this, or remember you were questioned over this or whatever, and then it brings back negative thoughts. Exactly. And you think, fuck, maybe I shouldn't be happy. But we can be happy, we can change, flip the chapter, we can move on, we can be good people. We are good people anyway, but exactly. we can create a better future. And I always promote that shit, like, don't worry about your past, like, create a better day and a, a better future, but it takes time. Do you still feel as if you're reliving a lot of negatives in your life? Yeah, if, <sighs> listen, the most... Take the abuse thing aside, for me, and it, and it will be because it's, he was a big part of my life. My being was being there for him. He was my purpose. I know it sounds strange, but he was my purpose. That was what I dedicated my, my life to, being a good friend, being a loyal friend, and just being a proper Stand up man. He weren't here. Someone had to defend the name on his behalf. And I took that, I took that man to one. That's on me. I done that. And I'm proud that I've done that. And I'm and I'll always be proud I've done it. And whatever, whatever mud, whatever lies they throw, they know it's bollocks. Because when they look in that mirror, they go. He was a fucking staunch man. He done. He never ever said no, and he always. He, I always deliver, mate. Always, whatever energy it takes out of me, and it sucks the life out of me sometimes. But I see it through, and I did him. Well, it would have been like that until the day we died, one of us. The one thing I never dreamed happening happened. Listen, there was always the opportunity. That one, the, the always the what the word, always the possibility of him calling me an informer. Because I've heard him say it so many times about people. So for me to think he wouldn't say it about me was a bit naive. Because you fall out with people, you have a thing, and off the cuff remark, and you say it. But I don't hate him. I've got no resentment towards him no more. Sadness that things got to that point that didn't need to get to that point. But I've also got a lot of pride that as a man, I fucking stood up, unlike most people, and confronted it like a fucking man, because that's what I am. I'm fucking, I'm a warrior. I don't, I don't roll over for no one. And I stood tall. I come unstuck. I went for a fight and come unstuck.
Simple as that. I didn't even go for a fight. I went to have a conversation, which evolved in, in uh, what happened. But you know what? It's done. It's sad, but it's done. Got no animosity to him, his boy. It's how it is. And they can't, they can't. No one can take that from me. No one. Because there's not a man on this planet could step forward and go, no, I know it's true. Because it ain't, and it can't be. There ain't. There's not one... There's not a man on this planet can say that about me. They can say it, but it won't be true. Has he ever came forward or messaged nah. after your podcast went out? No, nah. no. Nah. That's all. Listen, James, I said it before. Is all I wanted was the right to reply. I think if ever you say the things that's meant to have been said, what was said about me and my family, I think you, every man's got a right to have their say and defend himself. Any man, I don't give a fuck who you are. And that's what hurt me the most about the case. It was the fact that he robbed me of an opportunity to go a court. If he'd have called me as a witness, which was what I, all I hoped for, because that's what I put all my energy into, going to court. I had my story set up. I had everything in place. The man would have walked. He would have walked out of court. And I'd say why. That judge, if he doubted anything, he would have asked for a Newton hearing, right? He didn't ask for a Newton hearing except what was said. So if I'd have gone to court, I'm the only witness. I had, I had people coming, oh, I'm shopping myself here, but I'm only shopping myself. He didn't know about this because the messages never used to get through to him. That's the issue. I had someone gonna say, a man made a statement, didn't make a terrible, tarnished, got, Grass off, all he said was Paul was going to meet someone in his land. He shouldn't have done it, but he did. It's not a drama, but people will make a drama of it because he was my mate. I said to him, what you need to say is this. When I left you, you knew I had a gun on me. He went, you sure? I said, that's what you got to say. So he's up for it. He's up for being called as a witness. There was another witness who I spoke to, and they was willing to come to court and say, Paul asked me to get him a gun. He was willing to say that. He ended up losing all his, all his business and everything. Because when it was said that I was trying to buy a gun, the police went to him and took his business off him. Destroyed him. Not took his business, but told his people he works for, and they took his, all his livelihood from him. But I had everything in place. Let me get in court. If you don't want to see me face to face, call me in court. Let me go in court. Now you've got an opportunity to prove I'm an informer. You can challenge me. You can do whatever you've got. I can purge myself, which means they're gonna, they're gonna dis expose me. That's all I wanted. And I felt so robbed. I felt absolutely robbed. It took, it took all the wind out of myself because I put my energy into that, getting into a cult. And listen, two people have tried to help. Two people, me and one of his brothers who I've got utmost respect for. And I'll be honest with you, he's the only one who give me time of day. And he did give me the time of day. And he probably doesn't even realise the respect I've got for that man. And he's he of the family. See your own life, how many times you've been in prison, Paul? Four times. First time was the, well, I didn't go into full detail. I got two years for the robbery, which I didn't discuss. I got nicked outside, snatching a bag off a geezer going in a bank. I got two years for a robbery, two years for each stabbing, so that's four years. That was the first time I served three years of the four years, which was when I first met Pat. That was um, that was a learning curve for me. Who oh, saw? So? I come from a YP prison. I was in Ashford. I was in Lewis. And then I went to court. I was 20. And I got sentenced and got sent to Wandsworth. And I remember walking into Wandsworth this bouncy kid who's just come from a YP and I'm in this this reception area and I've gone into G Wing and it looks like saying I'm waiting for Oliver Twist to come walking out. That's how old and decrepit it was. <laughs> I'm all like, you wouldn't you'd never seen nothing like it. It was rotten. And they put me in the cell, just put me straight in the cell, and I remember sitting there thinking, Oh well, big boy, this is what you wanted, this is what you've got. I didn't come out of the cell for two days. I didn't eat. I just stood the door open and the noise was like a madass. 
And I put me in there and it was just all people running around with buckets of piss and buckets of shit. And I just shut the door. And then eventually I just thought, Paul, you got to fucking, you got to get on with this. What's the advice? Get in there, have a tear up, just fucking liven someone up. And I remember going to the op plate, queued up, and took the opportunity to just start a fight. Started a fight. That was it. Now we're saying, oh, youngster, what are you doing? And down the block, up out the block, everyone accepts me. And then it was easy running. Nothing. It was easy, simple. Second time, I got out in 86, I think. Yeah, about 86 I come out. And what was I Nick for then? 86. Got Nick for nine, in 94 for um, a lorry load of, what well, they found half a ton of cannabis on a lorry. And me and my mate got nicked for that. Got knocked get away. So we was on remark for a year. A few funny things happened there. But that's done. Got out on remand, got out of remand in 80s. 90s, that was 94, 95 we got out. I got nicked again in 2098, sorry, 98 for a gun in a car, which was a fucking mad, mad case. Come out my ass. I mean, I arranged for someone to drop one off to me. So I leave my ass, me and my wife. I see an AA van, so I thought, don't like the look of that. As we drove out, I've seen them. They're on me, about a mile and a half chasing me. I've got the gun down my waist. What am I going to do with this gun? I'm going around corners. I can throw it out. No, before I can, anyway, long story short, get out of the car, front of the seat. I'll get nicked. Me and my wife, both charged. She gets bowed, I'll get reminded. So, um, yeah, go to Belmarsh. Probably the, I went to the scrubs into Belmarsh. First night in Belmarsh, ass block, ass block four, which is the cat eight block. I go over there, walk on, someone invites me on. So I walk on the landing. And it's, I felt an uneasy presence on there. And I remember looking around me thinking, this don't feel comfortable. This really don't feel comfortable. Something's not right. Anyway, someone went to me, put their arm on my shoulder. He went, all right, mate, walking up. So I'm walking on, I went, thinking, what's this geezer want? He went, are you Paul? So I said, yeah. He went, you was the one who had to go at my old woman. I went, I don't know what you're talking about, mate. And as I turned away, he mentioned the name Wayne, right? And I remembered what he was talking about. His wife was insulting, ratting Wayne off when Wayne was ill. I insulted him and I said, are you fucking, you got, you keep your mouth shut, right? And I thought, he's going to throw. So I flung a punch at him. He's put me over, he's hit me on the chin. He's a boxer, ex-boxer, Charlie Tozer. Another fucking poor man who took his own life in prison. He put me over the table. It felt like the old world was attacking me, but where I'm kicking and kicking off, it was just, it looked like a trap. But I since found out it wasn't. And it took me 20 years to bump into Charlie again. He was having a meet with someone. I bumped into him. And I come up behind him. I went, Charlie. He went, hello, Paul, how are you? He was oblivious while I was there. I went, so how do you want to do it? He went, about what? He went, oh, you ain't talking about Belmarsh. I said, fuck me, of course I am. I want to know, like, and we've got into it. To be honest with you, at the end of the conversation, I'll give him 500 pound, because he just come home. And he went on his way. And we ended up quite good friends with Charlie. But, yeah, that was 2000 and, no, sorry, again, 98. So, long story short, I go to court, plead guilty. Before I go to court, I've got a watch, a Cartier Santos, remember the ones with the screws? Yeah. And there was a T-boy in there. He was armless. He was nicked on that Michael Michaels case. So, I'm, I'm walking around every day. You're gonna let me have your watch. You're let... He drove me mad. He's joking. So the day before I'm going to court, he went, you're a court man, aren't you? So I said, yeah. He went, would you reckon? I went, I don't know, four? He went, at that time, a three years was an average for a sentence for a gun. It ain't like now, it's five years automatically. Three years was an average sentence. Everyone was saying, you're gonna get free, you're gonna get free. 
He went, you'll get a free for that. So I went to him, if I'll get a free, you can have my watch. So he laughed. I got a coat, sitting in the coat. I end up with two and a half years, right? Straight away I thought, two and a half years, don't do this to me. Give me a three. Give me a four. Don't give me two and a half because I felt wrong. And in our world, you can't get a touch. If you get a touch, you like an ass. how do you get a touch? What's gone on? For six months. I'm going to be a rat for six months. But this is how I feel yet again. Low self-esteem, low self-worth. Self-imploding on myself. Ah, people's going to think that of me. So I get back to the prison. Go and see the governor the next morning. I said, I want to hand this in to someone. So he went, are you being bullied? So I said, no, mate, I'm not being bullied. So I told him the bloke it was. And they give him the uh, sent sand cyber to him. They reckon he, he couldn't believe it. Because people don't stick to their word. People don't keep their word. I keep my fucking word. And as a man, I had to give him the watch. He had it in the system. It was in the system, running around for about three years. My mate ends up in a prison with him, gets a story. He sells the watch to my mate. My mate hands it back out to me. And then my mate sends me a message. You got a, anyone got a watch I don't have? Gets an old watch. I said, I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll send you the watch in. And there's a story behind it. But it's got a good history, that watch, because it's got, a, it's got a blinding little story behind it. But yeah, so that's what I've got for that two and a half years. Went to Camp Hill. When was the other one? Camp Hill. Oh, then I got nicked for the, the heroin and the guns, which was absolutely complete bollocks. And that was, that's my, that's my bird, I think. See, when you're in prison, Paul, see, obviously, with the stuff you went through as a kid at 7 and 14, do you become very protective of being around a male environment? No, I didn't. Why? Because it, it, that was just buried. That was all buried deep. That only come out in, as I said, when I was about 46, 47, the first bit, and the last bit, when I was 14, that come out in 2013, 14, when I got my mates from when I come out of hospital. So that didn't, you don't think about it. There's a funny, there's a funny time that happened with Pat. He might remember this, he might not. He come around my house one Christmas and it was the Christmas before we fell out. And he went, uh, we were sitting in the front room, he come around to see the baby because my daughter had a baby. And he went, Paul, whatever happened to, and he cracked the geezer's name, right? He went, Whatever happened to his brother? He was like an hippie. Whatever happened to him? And this is the geezer that, right? And I went, how does he know? I think he's being spiteful, but he just happened to fright. I froze. I didn't know what to say. I just went, oh, I think he died. And he did. He died of age because when I come out of prison in 83, my intent was to kill him. And the first thing I'd done, I went around to someone's house. I said, where's he fucking live now? He went, I died of AIDS. Robbed, robbed. So it just never got spoken about. No, it never affected me in that way. Not that I'm aware of. Well, you could have been in for a murder. So when you say robbed, it's not. It's been a fucking blessing. Yeah, but I did feel robbed. I felt robbed. Did you want to torture the cunt? I just wanted to get. I just wanted to just have some sort of retribution room. He needed to suffer. He needed to suffer for what you've put me through. That one little incident fucked my whole life up. In, in, emotionally, it ruined me, and I couldn't ever. I couldn't even. I couldn't even tell no one about it. Couldn't tell no one because I was scared of the reaction. What would people say? Would they laugh? So every time someone mentioned something like that, I'd cringe. It's like when anyone used to mention crack, and Pat would go, "That fucking low life crackhead." Oh, I die because I'm on the crack. He don't know, and if. Any insult about something like that, I felt it. But as I say yet again, that ain't him doing nothing wrong. That's me. It's all, most of it is me. It's all internal where you It's are. all internal, yeah. It's all internal. I'm, I'm a very complex, very sensitive person. Really sensitive. People don't know it. There's a couple of people who know me who go, boom, but only because they're addicts. But you tend to see, Paul, every bad man, every criminal, every gangster, there's always the connection of being bullied or abused when they're younger. 
It's, it's there. Not, it's there. So when people say, oh, I always say this as well, but they ask me the question, do you ever get scared? I say, of course I don't, because I see vulnerability. I actually see good in these people who have done wrong. But if you actually listen to their story, you'll see that their life has been full of tragedy and trauma yeah. and torment where all the anger and frustration just becomes that defense of they don't want to be feel pain anymore so they're acting to it to hurt other people so they don't get hurt anymore because their whole life has been full of fucking torment mm. and and a lot of people's lives have been ruined because that's a life sentence that's why when abusers they should be getting fucking hung that's why i always say bring back the death penalty because these people deserve to die because the people who get abused it's a life sentence sometimes in here for them that they have to fucking relive the moments unless you deal with it. Mm. There's not a lot of people deal with it. As a man of your calibre, there's probably so many others like yourself who who are idiot. Listen. I, I, they don't want to be called. And yeah, and that's the hard thing. But when guys like yourself speak, come forward, you'd be surprised that other people go, fuck me, like, I'll resonate with that. Even when I had Marvin Herbert on, short, staunch as fuck, would do anything for anybody. And he was dying in the hospital. Nobody came to visit him. And I had a lot of empathy for Marvin with that. Once that, once that come on, I see it, I knew that feeling. Because I had that feeling. I only had a handful of people come to see me. Most of them was family and a couple of friends who, as I've said before, who was there. And when I woke up, and one, this one person, I remember him leaning over me and he put his head on my head. And I just felt this, this I felt a tear fall out of me. And it was such an emotional thing and I was telling this someone the other week, sitting there talking to someone, a bit of tie with someone. And I was telling him the story. And it absolutely, I nearly started crying because I felt how I felt when it happened. So I felt that closeness to this man. And he's, he's um, yes, yeah, there's so much people don't know about me. Friends. I don't, I, well, I don't think they do. I think people knew I was always out there to try and prove myself and trying to get myself a reputation and trying to be be loved. I never felt loved as a kid. Never loved myself. So how can anyone else love me? That's how you feel. Always been like it. Yeah, that's the hard thing. Because I know we, I always used to say that you can't love anybody until you love yourself. But then yeah. as times went on as well, I realised that that's not actually the truth because somebody can come into your life and show you enough love where you start accepting their love. I think it's all we do with acceptance. Because if I used to get a gift, I don't. I get embarrassed. I'm a giver. I always say as me. people please. Everybody gets. I'll cut about in Glasgow with fucking holes in my shorts with a dog biting at holes in my jumper. But all my kids and people that love ones, I'll do everything for them. You'll have the best. Me, I don't give a fuck. Don't I'm, give me anything, yes, please. And at the Christmas season birthdays, I get embarrassed. My sister, everybody, the missies, I'll, I'll get Christmas presents. I don't open them. It's embarrassing. Near enough before the new year but just what is that about i don't know i just it's just i don't know it's always i'm not so much now we're trying to get approval because i know what i'm doing is right i know i have made changes you'll get people from the area i grew up they'll throw little digs and i'm thinking shut up you're a fucking prick you, you don't even know me people I, I always kept my cars close to my chest even now i've never ever told my story in depth Ever. Yeah, you I've spoke about my, to everyone else. Yeah, yeah i've spoke about my addictions i've spoke about other things i believe when the timing's right i'll tell it and people will be shocked. That's actually the shit that I've been through, the shit that I've done, the shit. It's, I think I've cleaned my character up where I've became a better person, I've became a better soul, I try and do the right things over the last seven and eight years. My life's been full of misery and torment, but nobody realises the extent. And, and I, I'm glad I never told my story because then people judge me for who I am now and not who I was in the past. And once people actually realise the shit that I went through, they'll go, fucking hell, that, that kid's done well. Yeah, but I think with, with the amount of empathy and understanding you have with your interviews you've obviously been in a lot of them situations yourself you run just you get it straight away i never broke i've never people call themselves gangsters i was never a tough man i was always in the mix always in the middle i always knew how to manipulate situations I always made money I always done what i could to survive but not once did i break not fucking once yeah. and that's how when I, I laugh at people even some people come on the show like, i'm not there to challenge i'm not there to judge but I know when some people's pulling the fuck, you try to pull the wheel over my eyes, and I think, come on, like, you're not feeling any cunt, but, that's but that's, we all do that to some degree. But life's, we're never ever going to figure it out, Paul. And from who you were to what you're doing now is unbelievable. It's totally night and day. And I have nothing but respect for you and love for you. And I, I would always be there for you. And 
obviously this interview took a while because I wasn't too sure because obviously you would book it in and then you would step exactly. back and then book it in and, and you'd done the same the first time because I knew you were always sceptical but today's the day we finally put uh, the jigsaw if, together. You know why? Because as I said to you, I can't let my whole life be defined by one incident. My friendship with Pat was bigger than that one incident. My love for Pat was like, he was on a pedestal. He was on a, put him before my wife, my kids. His own wife used to say that. He puts him before his wife and kids. That's just me. Because I never had a brother. I wanted a brother. And he was my brother. He might not have seen it that way, but I did. I was an uncle to his kids. I would look after him in the best way I could. And indirectly, his brothers was my brothers in my head. And I would treat them accordingly. But at the end of the day, when it was explained to me and they went, oh, it just still fell into place. And I thought, hang on a minute, Paul. You've took everything to art. People ain't come and seen you and gone, listen, mate, take no notice. We ain't taking no notice. And when they didn't, I took it a little bit, oh, I was hurt by it, really hurt. Fucking hell, unbelievably hurt. But all I was to them was Pat's mate. They weren't my brothers. I was Pat's mate to them. That's who I was described as. And I thought I was full of more than what I was. But that ain't down to them, that's down to me. That's me having that, having that what I wanted, that belonging, being part of something. Because I never felt part of my own family. I never did. Just felt odd one out. And I think that was because of my sisters. Because they come along and upset the apple cart. And being as uh, sensitive I was, it just, yeah, I never felt right. So I went through all the chaos. I went through the football hooliganism. Joined the cadets to start with. This is it. I'm going to be in the Navy, right? Got out of that. And I've never... I've just constantly battled to find my place. And where Pat was concerned, I found it. I will be his, I will, this is my, this is my job now. This is my job. And he's, he's the only one that really fucking helped me out in life. And he did. It, it all went wonky, but I don't forget James, right? I've got a very long memory for people that have done things for me. And I respect them. And I'll never forget it. And me and Pat used to argue about this certain person. He would run this geezer down, rat him off. And I used to go, look, mate, I'm not being horrible, but I can't run him down. I come out of prison in 83, 85, 85, 86. I come out of prison, I had nothing. He didn't know me. He come around, he walked in the pub, walked around, he went, you just come home. I went, yeah, give me 100 quid. 100 pound in 86 was a few quid. It, it meant something then. And to this day, I've always said, anyone running down, I go, look, maybe so, but I don't forget what he done for me. And I think there's a part of Pat thought that I didn't appreciate how he dealt me. But I thought he'd have recognised the way I show my appreciation is by being your your person who, who will do anything for you. I'm now, there's my appreciation. I will look after your boy. I will back your boy up in any situation. And I don't think he realized that's what, that's what I was doing, paying back a debt that I didn't owe. But to me personally, I had to. That, talking about that, show you how vulnerable you were, that if somebody was good to you, yeah. You would literally pay your life with yeah. killing someone or million dying percent. for them. Million percent. Without even, without even, it don't even, I don't even have to think about it. It's what I would do. I will be your protector. I will be your, your, whatever it takes. I'll give my life. It's scary because I used to see people in crowds and used to, I used to look at, I used to think I want to be them. I want to be part of that. But as, as I've got older, and the knowledge that I've got now, I understand flying solo is the biggest strength you can ever have in life. And now, in yourself. And that takes time because if you've been through trauma as a kid, it's tribalism. You want to feel part of something. Why do people go to football? Because they feel part of something. It. It's like a brotherhood. Why do people fucking 
join the cadets or go to the army, there's something missing. Exactly. There's a tribal, uh, we're all we're all tribes, we've all got families, but there's always an element of what else is missing, so we we'll want to join something to feel part of it, even though it's the wrong decision sometimes. Did you feel misunderstood, Paul? Yeah, uh, yeah. In what sense? I just, I, as I said to you, I'm a very complex person. I know I am, right? I see things so different to other people you wouldn't believe, but it's how I see things. But I didn't think, all right, if I'm, an, I'm a person who wants to be on a one-on-one -on -one level, right? Me and you, three people, nah, don't suit me. I like one-on-ones. That way I'm, I'm on an equal, equal, I lose that, what's the word? Um, I'm just not comfortable. I'm not comfortable. I don't like being in, even though I go to football and I go fine at football, and I, that I'm part of. But if I'm in an, in an intimate situation where there's three of us sitting there, I don't feel I'm on the outside looking in. That's how I am. I'm on the outside looking in. People don't know me. People think they know me. If they knew me, they they may be a little bit more understanding and a little bit... Listen, no one has used that word to me at all. It's only ever come out of one mouth. And that wasn't out of a mouth, that was on a text. It's maybe said beyond my back, but not to my face. I've lost, I had so many put our called friends. And I won't say in London, I'll say in Islam. A lot of friends in Islam. And I'm not talking about them as a family, I'm talking about other people. And they all turn their back on me by not even contacting me, these ones. People I didn't know, proper faces. I got a phone call from. Mickey McAvoy, right? Mickey McAvoy's a legend, right? In my eyes, right? And I went, and I had a fallout with Mick 30 years ago over Wayne. And I said to Mick, um, he wrote in my son, went, Mick wants to talk to you. All right, Mick, I said, listen, before you start, Mick's, got, Mick's died now, right? Fucking, what, what life did he have? What chance would way people treated him, Nick, and his fucking money? And he went, Paul, let me just tell you something. No one thinks that of you. Now, he's the one person I thought would have because we didn't speak. We had a fallout. And I went, let me apologise to what I said to you over Wayne. He went, why you got to apologise, Paul? You was doing what was right for your mate. You're a fucking long man. You stuck up for your mate. He said, no, I can, I've looked at your eyes in them podcast. He said, I've never, ever looked at a podcast, but I watched your one. He said, no, I can see the fucking pain and I can also see the loyalty in them. That... That and the fact that one of his brothers come and see me was the two main things that give me that little bit more. It made me feel okay. They made me feel okay. Without them two things, I'd have just been in 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 turmoil all the time. Were you ever suicidal with it? Oh fuck me! Three or four times I've gone. <laughs> yeah, don't uh, in my life, James. I used to go for walks. <laughs> And I'd literally go, I can't do this no more. I don't want to be in this, because I never thought I could be happy again. I'd never thought I could be friends with anyone again, because I didn't want anyone around me. I'd be on my own, and I used to go, yeah, I'm gonna kill myself, I've had enough. I can't keep putting my wife through it. I'm making everyone in the ass unhappy. And I'm not, well, I'm making myself sad. But then I think, hang on, Paul. The only people who's gonna suffer is your family. You're gone. You leave them with this shit. So I didn't do it. I didn't do it because I didn't have the arse I would do it as well. You must have been hard work for your family as well, Paul. Oh, mate. Listen, my wife... Because it has that ripple effect where it's oh, the destruction it causes around you, the anger. Because we take it out on the people we love. It's terrible. My, my kids are stuck by me all the way. Right? They've never bought any shame to my ass. They've never done anything to embarrass me. They're just... They're two proper, proper daughters. And my wife, 35 years, I've put her through some shit. She's stuck with me throughout the drugs and the, 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 the madness and the paranoia and walking around the ass with a fucking gun or a big dagger and thinking, never knowing who, but thinking someone's coming. It was usually the police I was expecting, but I know if the police come, I'm going to drop it anyway. But 
the paranoia in my house must have been fucking horrendous. My kids used to walk past me and walk, go walk in the room and move me out of the way. Because I'd be like that, looking at the window, looking at the corner. Like, excuse Dad. Just took it for granted. And when I have to think about that, that's fucking terrible. Because that's trauma for them. That's the trauma of my, my door being... It never used to get kicked in because I used to fucking hear them. I had it, because don't forget, I'm awake. I'm, I'm laying in bed watching the telly. It's four o'clock in the morning, three o'clock in the morning. So don't think you can slip up my path without me hearing you, because I heard them. I heard them a couple of times. I looked down, I remember one day I went, I've heard this noise, right? So I'm, I'm watching the untouchables. So I hear, click, click, click. I thought, that sounds like the noise of the old shutters going up on the back of the evening standard van. So I thought, well, it definitely ain't an evening standard van. That's how I built. And as I got, I looked up underneath the curtain, I looked under, the, and I just heard, compromise, compromise. The street lit up, and they was all screaming. And I just remember, I remember just looking, I went, morning chaps. They went like fucking lunatics. I had red dots all over me. Long story short, open the door. How can I open the door? You're, you're screaming at me. Let me come downstairs and open the door. Don't put the door in. Come down, let them in. I'm pulling Nick for a fucking shooting. Nothing to do with me. Nick for a shooting, me and three other kids, all, all called Paul. All knew each other, but we was all part of this so-called conspiracy. It was nothing to do with us. Genuinely nothing to do with us. But, um, yeah, my, my kids haven't seen see that. That's on one occasion, and it happened again six weeks later in the house looking for guns again. And it was like, fuck me. My kids can't keep having to put up with this. But they have, and they still, I think they, they understand me. They understand. One of my daughters is very similar to me. The other one's completely different. But my granddaughter, she's, yeah, she's the first grandchild. And she's, um, I put her through a trauma and all. This is why I've, since I've come out of the hospital, she's never been the same, my granddaughter. And I sat down with her one day and spoke about it. And I said, listen, I said, what's the matter? So she went, well, when you were in the hospital, they told me you fell out of a tree. She said, but I would sit there. Now, don't forget, she was probably two, maybe two and a half, three. She still knew what was going on. She was about three. And she said, I used to think, well, why have all these policemen got guns if he fell out of a tree? She said, and they'd all be talking, but she's listening. She ain't stupid. Yeah, kids. And it's, clever. she's never been the same with me. She's the same. I go to cut a wound, she's, she's like that. And we're both like that. And it's, it's sad. But, um, yeah, I've put them through trauma, my kids. And they don't, they, and I swore, that's the reason why I moved out to where I moved. I didn't want my kids growing up amongst all that chaos no more. I wanted them out of the way. And we had a good year there with, and it was good. But then it all went, it all went wonky when that happened. But they're all right now, and they've got a grandson, which was the other thing that I was, I was missing in my life. Because I used to adopt people's kids. That's what I used to do. Wayne's son, Pat's son, other people's sons. I'd just sort of take them under my wing and they'd become my little mates, you know what I mean? But now I've got my own little mate. But I've met some great people since this. People that ain't toxic, people that ain't nasty, people that are genuinely good people. Good arts, good motivation and positive energy. And it's, I've got, I'm really good friends with an ex-Arsenal footballer. And you saying about people giving you gifts. The first time I met him, he asked me if I could do him a favor about something. And he turned up with a signed Arsenal football and an Arsenal shirt. And I was sitting there and he went, yeah, mate, just for something for you. And I went, oh, oh, oh quivery, didn't know what to do. And he pulled me on it a couple of months later, he went, you don't like receiving presents, do you? I went, why? He went, oh, when I give you the ball and the shirt, you melted. He said, strange. I went, but that's what I'm like. I don't, I've got to do something to justify something. Don't give me something for nothing. Don't come up and go, yeah, mate. It's not for me. It's not for me. I don't take, I, most people out there can be bought. Everyone's got their price. I ain't. I ain't, people can, people have, I've heard of stories where people's gone, yeah, he took this and he had that amount of money. None of it's true. Don't 
don't talk behind my back because you're just talking about something you don't know. You want to know something, come and ask me and I'll give you a straight answer. I can't be bought, so don't fucking try and buy me. No one can buy me. And that annoys me, that people can think that I can be bought. That's why I resent a lot of the people down there. And I'll say it again, I'm not talking about them. I'm talking about friends who I've been there for, people I've put through rehabs, people I've helped get off drugs, people I've, I've given money, I've looked after. I've, I don't think people realise how much I've given to people. I'm not talking about financially, energy and everything. But people will say that's a weakness. They take the piss. So that's good that you can feel positive people and good people. I'm at a stage in my life now, I know who's good and who's not. So if you're not enhancing my life, if you're not bettering my life, bettering my family's life, I ain't interested. If you need help, by all means, I'll be there if, if I know. That's the same. Yeah. I can help you. But I don't have to get too much going on to be... I used to be a people pleaser as well and try yeah. to do all the right things to fit in yep. but now I can say no now I just listen it's not happening I'll, I'll be there when I need to be or I, no I'll, I'm at a place where I know what's right for me mm -hmm. I don't know how long I've got on this planet so it's to keep building this and taking it to new heights and keep providing for the family and try to create memories everything, ev everything else doesn't mean it's it's, it's, it's always it's relevant. relevant yeah everything I've, I've gone through it now I've had all the, all the watches right they all had to go because we had to live, right? So everything had to go. All the, all the um, what you'd call them, them stupid materialistic shit, right? It all went. And once I got rid of what materialistic shit I had around me, I didn't have nothing to worry about now. The watches are gone. They're, they're all gone, right? I'm in a... I'm in a my actual life is, is so simple now apart from when I have a meltdown for a week or two and I don't talk to no one, where I just go into my own head and I lock myself upstairs. But I'm, I'm, I've got all the people in my life I need. I don't need no one else in my life. There's a few people I haven't seen for a while, but that's because I didn't have the energy to their emotional baggage. I couldn't carry it. I had enough carrying my own and I had to just go, look, I've got to back off for a little while. And I, I weren't happy about doing it, but I had to do it for my own benefit and my own mental health because it was making me fucking ill. It was making me so ill. And yeah, I'm doing I'm doing positive stuff now. As I said to you, I'm I'm I help the kids. I do things with schools, I do things with this this changing lives, which is a good it's a good organisation which has started from nothing. And they they help a lot of kids. And I got I got a, a comment. A little while ago, there's a kid there, he was a landfill. And he didn't stop fighting, bashing people up. Big, big lump. And I, I sat him down and I, I should talk to him. And in the end, he used to come in and say, it's Paul in. And they'd ring up and go, listen, so-and-so wants to see you. So I'd go down there, I'd go and see him, sitting there talk to him. Anyway, as I said to you earlier, I do a thing called um, restorative justice. You get, you, get an, um, you get a court order, referral order. Rather than send you into custody, you plead guilty, you get a referral order. You go on this panel. On the panel is me and someone else who's a volunteer. We sit there with you, your family, and the, the um, youth offending team. And we work you out little contracts of what you've got to do. We look at all their records. We get all the access to everything. So we go through all their files. Right, he's, he's this, he's messing about with that, he's doing drugs, blah, 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 blah. And they have to go through all these little, over the 12 months, they have to satisfy everything on it if they mess up three times then we have an option to send them back to court and i just said to them straight away don't expect me to send anyone back to court no one and i won't i just refuse to i'm not going to do that i'm not sending them back to court you've got to keep trying if you don't keep trying what are you doing it for so i'm, I'm persistent with it and this mother come in and this bloke come in the kid come in and he walked in and he went because i'm you don't know i'm there so I went, all right, Paul. So I went, how are you? And he went, he whispered something. She went, is that Paul? So she went, he went, yeah, she went, can I thank you? She said, you've changed my son's life so much. How he acts, what he does. She said, you can't believe what he, how he thinks of you. Ah, oh, that made me feel 
great in my life. That just gave me such a lift. I thought, well, that one kid, it's worked on one kid. He's got to work on others. So I, that gave me great, great pleasure. Last week, a lady, I finished doing what we had to do for, for three months. And she come in and she gave me a voucher for Costa Coffee for a fiver. And she went on the thing, thanks for helping my family. That, that meant something. That was a, that really meant something to me. And it was strange. And I thought, all them years, I'd be running around like a lunatic trying to get this and that. And that meant something. That's how, in life, how them small things mean the most to you. It's the given, and that's it's, it's amazing. It's I'm trying to do it in a positive. You're back in the day when you're running in that circle, you're given by anger, frustration, vengeance, negativity. And you start changing your life, Paul, and seeing the world a bit differently, and start getting praise for positive things actually means something when nobody's been harmed internally. That kind of makes the pieces of pain not so tough and they kind of come together and life makes sense so when you're looking at your past as well no doubt you've inflicted a lot of pain on people with the circles that you yeah, get about that. do you have many regrets with that and i know people say oh hindsight's a wonderful thing but um is there anything that sticks out you think mm, you yeah there's you probably a couple of things that, that could have been handled differently mm -hmm. but but your method of thinking then was you were doing the right thing yeah Ain't it fucked up how the mind yeah. is, how when you think that life of crime and misery and pain and causing pain on others is normal? Of course. That's sad the way life goes. And because I've spoke to so many people, I see a lot of sadness in people as well. Not so much you today, but back three years ago, I thought, fucking hell, man, you're struggling. Cause yeah, I, uh, I was in trouble, man. I was in trouble. It's, 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 uh, yeah, there's a few regrets. But I'll, I'll say one thing. With this whole scenario with me getting shot and the build-up to it, I wouldn't have changed any of that. I would have still, I would have, I would have still stuck to my guns. I would never have flung his boy under a bus for whatever part he had to play in it. I would have still done the same. The only, maybe my ego, because that's what, if I'd have just gone, Paul, take no notice. This will just die down and he'll move on. It was my ego. It wouldn't let me. It won't fucking let me. And it was, uh, I'll, I'll say it again. It was cause I was hurt. It was my brother. And I keep calling him my brother cause that's how I treated him. That's how I treated him. Spent most of my fucking life with him, over in Spain with him, back here. Get up in the morning and it'd be the first thing I'd do, ring him up and, but, but he just looked at strange things in life and I couldn't understand his, his if I ring you up, if you're my friend, and I'll give you a for instance, I've been getting followed. Mike, this is him. I've been getting followed by these Eastern Europeans. I don't know what they're fucking up, so I think they're going to wrap me up or something. So I ring him up the next day, no answer. Ring him up four or five times, no answer. In Paul's head, he's wrapped up, he's tied up. Probably been shot in the fucking head, he's been dead. What am I going to do? What am I going to do? So I'm now panicking. Because in my head, it's happened. It has actually happened. Ah, oh, fucking hell. Then all of a sudden, I find out he's in prison saying, fucking ringing up, finding out where I am. Asking people where I am. I'm asking because I fucking love you. And I'm, I'm scared something's happened to you. That's why I'm asking where you are. You're my fucking mate. Don't you understand that? Pat looks at it a different way. Why do you want to know where I am? Because... Yesterday I'm with you. Today I can't find you. I'm worried something's happened to you. I didn't understand his mentality of that. And that was wrong. And that was one of his excuses why I'm a police informer. Because he's always asking where I am. He thinks it's for the police. The police can follow you on cameras. Come on. He ain't in 1970 or 1980 no more. Even though he shot you, it's turned your life upside down at that moment and fucking suicidal mode shit that's been said to you if he rang you up right now and says i'm sorry what would you do that would do that would do it won't happen but that would do all he'd have to do is it all he'd have to do is just listen he wouldn't even have to speak to me just go listen and i'd fill in a few gaps for him 
and he realised he'd been taken for a fog. He would. Bay one, I like to think before I leave this earth, me and him can actually bury the hatchet, it's the right, wrong word to use, but look, at this point in my life, I've put a line under it. That part of my life was, was complicated. It was fucking hard work sometimes, hard work, but it's done. It's done. I'm in a different, I'm in a different mindset now. I hope his life, I hope he, he's happy and I hope he's getting on with what he's doing. Where I am, I'm happy. If ever the opportunity come, where me and him can meet one-on-one, -on -one, I'd love it. It won't, because what can he say? Everything he said, he knows his bollocks, but there's nothing he can say. Put it this way, if I had done what he'd done, which I, I could, these brothers, right, wouldn't treat their friends like that. They wouldn't treat their friends that way. I'm sorry, but it's just not something you would do. Not someone who's been here 25 years and you've got no ammunition on him, you don't start creating it. They just wouldn't do that. So I, what can he actually say to me? There's nothing he can say. People like you never thought you'd be the man you are today with the shit you've been through. You don't know what he's had to deal with as a kid. You don't know what he's been through in life Listen, to then see the world like that. And make he's had a rough go. He's had a rough go. He's had a, he's had a rough go. But I think... And it's sad to see because I know great fucking people whose that life is just totally... <laughs> Most of the people in that world, fucked. most of the people in that world, there's nobody gets out, Paul, you know that yourself, everybody I, mean, I know from Glasgow, there's one man probably who's lived a decent life and he's, he seems to got everything Ferris. together, he's older, Paul, I rate highly and I'm still good friends with him, but there's another man from where I grew up, a bit older and he's done everything, created business, made a bit of money for himself, never told his story, just does his thing, drives a nice big car, and I thought, because there's not many people I know that's got out, high calibre, all around the fucking world, him I kind of, he's, he's done a bit of damage in the day, and, and it must, you know, they'll sell the screams, the trauma, the pain, whatever, it will affect him, no doubt, but I always thought, there's not many I know who's kind of got out with it all together and still kept her head above what without either getting done with proceeds of crime or getting sent to prison or losing loved ones around them. There's not yeah, many. It's all this. You got, and that's what I look at. I look at this. That's what I say to these kids. You, you're not in this. Don't think you're in this for fucking life, life, life a lifetime job because it ain't, and it ain't. It can change at the drop of an hat. It can change in a second. You just, if you're in it, you're in it. But if you ain't in it, you can't be involved, can you? Step, step back from it. It's, it's fucking chaos. It ends in three ways, doesn't it? You know where it ends up. Mm. Dead, prison. Well, there ain't really have another way, is there? Dead or in prison. Is that? Or in a little one-bedroom flat on your own. On your ass with nothing. That's, I've seen people, I've, for years, I've believed, multi-millionaires, got to be, been in the game for years. I feel fucking sorry, but faces, proper fucking legends. Freddie Foreman. It's a fucking little, little flat. That's not the life I thought he would be having now. It's, it's yeah, a lot of tough bastard. The Rab Crillers, he was Glasgow, Manchester, died a lot in, in Codder, I think. Glasgow, I just had uh, Russell McVicker on, yeah. his father, John McVicker, he died alone in a caravan in Essex. But these people are so there's so much respect for these men as well, but yet. Like you say, everybody thinks they're doing well. And Russell, he never spoke to his dad for years. He thought he was doing okay. He thought he was sweet. And he says, if I fucking knew, he says I would have been there. Because in my mind, we think people, like you say, been in the game for 40 years, 50 years, he must have a fucking nice yeah. little nest egg at, at by. But you know yourself, that one loss of parcel, that one fucking big sentence, you're batting your ass again. For Everything sure. goes to fuck. And sure. the coppers only need to get lucky once. Once, you got to get right every day. For, for what, 20, 30, 40 years? Like I say, I don't know anybody that's made their money and got out and they're sitting comfortable. One person out of fucking thousands that I've came across over the years. 
<laughs> and everybody's going, it's a vicious cycle. I used to look up to the men in Glasgow who had the convertible BMWs and nice big blondes in the front seat and I thought, I need to be that. How do they be there? Selling gear and you thought, that's what I'm going to do. And then you realise how fucked up and depressing that life is because none of them, after 10 years, are on their feet. They're all in and out of prison. Their birds are haggard. Fucking three, four kids to different men and it's just a waste of life, man. And it's sad to think that that's so normalised through the years. I think a lot of people are waking up to it now because a lot of people like yourself and a lot of people in the underworld actually speak of the misery and torment it causes and the destruction it causes, not just with the person who do it, but the people around them, their wives, their mums, their It's their, their family. Yeah. It's the people that we take for granted who we don't even talk about. We don't consider the fact what I found. I never considered what this would do to my wife and kids by my acting how I did that day and going down there. I never give it a second thought because it was all about Paul. How I felt. I never asked them how they felt. But it, it was, as I say again, it was me. It was the fact of, I've got to stand up. I'm not like you other people. I stand up for my fucking self and my family. And it was, it was ego. It was ego. Could have been handled different from both sides. Yeah, it should have been handled differently. But it wasn't. And this kid, well, he didn't do too fucking bad at the end of the day. It's mad, don't you think, that we love our family or I do anything for my message, I do anything for my kids, but yet people don't start a life of crime because that destroys your family and kids. If you really love your wife or your girlfriend, your kids, your mum, your dad, you go out and get a job, you take it to new heights, you work hard and try and do the right thing. Now, nowadays, everybody talks about being alpha and doing this. It's all bollocks. You want to be a proper alpha. You want to be a proper man. Provide for your family. No matter what it takes. No matter if it's shoveling shit, flipping burgers. It don't matter. Or building fucking skyscrapers. All it needs to be, as long as you're providing for your family, your missus, your kids, you're already winning. And it's not, don't buy into all the fucking glitz and the glam, the private planes, this and that. These people, if they're living that good life, why do they need to post it all the time? Why do they need to do exactly. videos, sitting themselves, talking pure shit about life when they just been brought up in a fucking silver spoon where they're just talking absolute out their ass that ain't yeah. life that ain't normal yeah. being normal is fucking providing and protecting being there yeah. for your family working hard providing for them then your life's all gravy whatever else comes into that then it's all fucking golden like you can take things to new heights and make as much as you want you have got a clean sheet to take whatever you want in life and but you've had all the watches you've had all the big cars it don't mean fuck all i bought a couple of nice watches all distractions. and i think fucking hell that it's just all to feed something and pre an image for yourself that you're you're doing okay. Yeah. But let's talk about the what you're fucking dealing with up here. Exactly. Let's talk about after, are you okay? And when you actually ask that question, you tend to see a lot of people do struggle with answering that. Listen, as I as I said, there's this is something I'm really, really passionate about, only because of what happened to Wayne. But the amount of kids who are in this prison system who shouldn't be in the system because they're mentally ill, or they've got mental problems, or they've got drug problems, before they get to the system. So you're in a cult. Why are you gonna send these kids to prison, right? They're not, in a, they're not in a good place, they need help, right? But you're not even offering them any help, you're not even identifying the Ill illness. They get in the system. And we, we're trying to do something at the moment to get an into the, the documentary game about the prison system and the state of it. Young kid, about a month ago, He's coming home. He's, he's, he got knocked down his parole. He's due out. He'll be out soon, right? He's looking forward to everything. His wife, his kids. He's in a great place. Takes his own life, right? He's, this is Paul Bryant, good friend of, of, of my, my pal's family and everyone. It would have people from his own name. The last person you would have expected it. He took his own life. Wayne took his own life. They're not identifying none of this. And I just find it so sad that kids, Wayne was a man, he's a kid. He's a man, but he's still a kid in my eyes. You've got screws who are in the system. They're there to lock up prisons. They're not there to deal with mentally ill people. They're not just trained to identify all that. They don't know the difference whether they're on drugs or whether they're mentally ill. So they treat them all the same. This kid had the same problem as what Wayne had. His family was ringing up constantly. He's not, he's not being himself. They didn't act on it. 
They didn't do nothing. And he kills himself one night. Wayne done exactly the same. The family was trying to get him moved to an hospital. <coughs> that took three years. That inquest to get get that to inquest and fight the case. And some of the things that were said in that inquest was unbelievable. The psychiatrist, she went, what we're actually doing is we tried to do a trial with Wayne. So, so the barrister said, what do you mean a trial? She said, we're going to do a trial test with him to see how long he could last without his drugs. Because he's been on them for 30 years. So what we're going to do now is just try and see if he works without them. All right? So you're now just taking your, this, the drugs that this man survived on off him for a little test run. So they said, and when was the trial going to end? She went, well, when he relapsed. Well, he fucking relapsed that night and killed himself. So what good was that? Anyway, some of the things that were said in the trial was the night screw. He went to Gambia. They weren't, they weren't going to call him. So we said, stop the thing. We're, done. we're not going on until you call him back. So they got him back to England and made him give evidence. And they asked him the questions about what would you have done if you'd have looked in the hole? Because he didn't do the night check. He never checked at all. So he wouldn't have seen it. But if he'd have looked in, he said, what would you have done if you'd have seen this man in this distressed state? He went, nothing. He said, but you've got a key on you for emergencies. And he went, it's not my job. This is average talking. It's not my job. African geezer. I'm not looking at him, but the jury are hearing this. And he said, no, I wouldn't have opened the door up and helped him. I'd have just gone down, the, which he, he, he didn't happen because he didn't check. But eventually, the jury see everything that was said and see all the holes in all the gaps in them. And they said he's neglected, he, his mental health was neglected by the prison. They should have identified he was having a relapse, which he did. And they didn't, it, and he died. Another needless death. So you got Wayne, Paul Bryan, Charlie Tozer killed himself. There's, there's so many people that are just, we move on. No one says nothing. There was nothing in the papers about Wayne's death, about the inquest result. Nothing, but there was plenty in the papers about Wayne this, Wayne that, when he was, when he killed himself. But nah, nothing, nothing. Who was Wayne the jigsaw killer? No, Wayne was the, um, he was the so-called number public enemy number one. And who was a jigsaw killer you spoke about? That the was first my podcast? cousin. Wasn't it? Yeah, my cousin. Yeah, he was a mad bastard, wasn't he? Yeah, he weren't well him. <laughs> Another one. He's ill. He's ill, but he hasn't. He's he's um. Being honest with you, he's he's got his life. I know he's in prison. He's in prison probably for the next rest of his life. But he's got his in there. He's a chef. He's 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 flying. Makes everyone cakes and he. Yeah, he, he's, he's all right. He's found his little purpose in life. But when you're in there for 38 years, you've got to. I've got friends that are in there doing, this is what I'm saying to you. When I'm, I'm such a bad person, right? I've been visiting people who I met in prison since 1990s who are still in there. I'm still visiting them. I'm still, I'm still not forgetting these people because I've got a good memory. With things like that. So we'll say more, you've got a good heart. I've got a good heart. I'm not a terrible person. I've done terrible things. But I'm not a terrible person. And as I said, I've got, the, the people I've got in my life now are positive. One of them's, I, I haven't been working. Someone's given me a job. And I really appreciate what this man's done because he's, he's, he's changed my life. He's changed my life where I haven't got to worry about where the next bills are going to get paid from. My wife works, but she funds her own power, as I explained to you, what she does, the powerlifting. And there's a lot of good energy in my life. My wife's 60 years old. I'm going to talk about her because I'm, I'm so proud of what the girl's done. She took up powerlifting. She done strong woman competitions, then went into power. She weighs 57 kilos. She got picked through, through her other competitions and got picked to represent Team GB. She went to Canada, won three golds. Budapest, one gold. She'd just come back from Ireland, come first, one gold. 145 deadlift, as I said to you earlier. 57 K. See, I couldn't do a 145 deadlift. And I definitely couldn't do a 120 squat. She's a but she's someone who moved on. When this happened, 
I come home from hospital, she got me better, and then she got life. I didn't. I wallowed. I felt sorry for myself. She will not mention his name in any way, shape, or form. If I mention it, she goes like that. She's not interested. Today, when she knew I was coming in, she went, what are you doing? So I said, listen, I'm going to put a line under everything. She went, do what you want. She thinks, I'm, she thinks, why am I doing this? But she don't understand. I can't leave things unsaid. Mm -hmm. I have to have a, it has to be finalised. And that's just, that's one of my biggest problems. I can't leave things un, unfinished business. And I think that's why it's important today is to put a lean under it. It is. No more anymore. Talk about the positives in life. Talk about what you've achieved and talk about your misses, the good energy, the positive. Yeah, yeah. Even when you're speaking about it, though it's not doom and gloom, you've kind of absorbed the pain with it. It's kind of just there and you deal with it. I don't feel the pain no Yeah. More. I'm hurt, but I don't feel the pain. I can't. As soon as I think about it, it don't hit me in the stomach. Mm -hmm. it's, it's gone. As I say again, it was, it's been a mad journey. It has been a crazy journey when I think back on some of the um, exploits. But it's also, it's been a, it's a pleasure being part of whatever it was. And it was, um, yeah, it's, it's been mad, but moved on now. I'm in a better place and uh, a lot of what I was going to say, I, I forgot. But yeah, I'm, I'm, um, Yeah, yeah, I'm all right. I'm all right now. That's what I like to see. Who was Wayne then? Public enemy number one. He was a mad bastard as well. Wayne, well, yeah, he's my. He was a, like a brother-in-law, mm -hmm. and I, he was sort of he was big in my life until he went to prison. I was in prison. He was on the run. I come out of prison. I got with Pat, and Wayne was then in prison for the next twenty years. But he was um he was a gay man, Wayne. They, they just, they ruined him. They ruined him in the system. And then he just, uh, I felt sorry for that man. What it must, I don't know what it's been like for me in 10 years with the mental health things, right? And what that man must have gone through in like 25, 30 years, it must have been torture for him. And there, there are certain things that I do regret that I didn't give him more of my time. I never, Listen, when he was, he was nicked for this case, we applied for bail. I said he can stay out my ass. But because of his the mental illness and all the blood, they would never allow it. They said it's not even worth it. I wouldn't let him stay there because of the kids and blah, blah, blah. In case he goes off on one. But that was, that was an, um, if I'm honest, I never cried when my mum died. Never cried when my dad died. But I cried when Wayne died. Why? because I felt that I should have been there for him more than what I was. I just felt that that's what I should have done. Yeah, but that's not on you. You can't be there for everyone. Everybody's their own person as well. Should have just given him a bit more of my time. That's the hard thing, because I've lost family members. I've said, spoke about it loads of times, family members to murder and stuff, and I feel as if possibly when I was going through changes just to try and... But it's too hard to guide anybody or try and fucking teach anybody because it's... Focusing all your energy on yourself to make changes is fucking difficult. Yeah, no. Never mind trying to help everybody else. And sometimes you've got to rein it all in. It's like an octopus. Just try to help everybody else and do everything. But then once you take the fucking reins in and just work on you, and that's when you can start making the changes. No, you're because right. it's not about everybody else. And we can always have a heavy heart. What could have been, what could have been says. But like we always say, hindsight is a wonderful thing. And we can't fucking relive the past every day because it will just destroy us. The past is done. Is it sad and as hard as it is, would listen. If people ask the question, sometimes to people, would you change anything? People say, "Nah, hindsight's a wonderful thing." And I would change many things in my past. I would say to different people, "Not to go there or whatever." I would fucking change many things in my life. I would make better decisions. My life might not be as good as it is today, but I still like to think I could have made better choices back then because I wouldn't be the man I am today with the shit that I've been through, and that's understood. But I just know. If I'd have tried even more at football, if I'd have been surrounding myself with better people, because all the people you're talking about, they're all mad bastards, killers, robbers. It's a circle you kept. It's, it's, it was what we was brought up in. Yeah. 
that was the circle of, of that was our circle of life. That was, my life was always going to be one of crime, prison, whatever, because of, my, I told you, my, one of my major situations, the fact that I lived and I used to look into the, the prison yard, Pentonville Prison, that was before there was a fence, it was just a wall. And I'd sit on that windowsill watching them walk round on exercise, fascinated. So I was always had the fascination with prison. And I wanted to know what it was like. And when I then just told you, when I got into Wandsworth, that was horrendous. That was the biggest shock. That was like, let me out today and I'll go and get a job. That's how it felt. I thought, I can't deal with this. But I did. What's the worst prison you've been in? The worst prison I'd say in the 80s was Wandsworth. It was a hate factory, that's what it was called. The hate factory, it was just a warehouse of, there was no, it was you and them. All the cons stuck together. You didn't talk to screws. You didn't have anything to do with screws. The worst prison for me personally was Albany, which is, I went to Grendon from Wandsworth because of the city fight and all that. They put me there. Anyway, get kicked out, go to Albany. This is quite a mad story. So I walk in Albany. I put me on D-Wing. So Pat's on D-Wing. So I walked in, he went, ah, oh, fuck me, what are you doing? Anyway, yep, so we're on a little food boat, me, him and a geezer named Joe the Greek. This was, this was like mind-blowing, this what happened. So I'm there probably two days, and then there's a little bit of an altercation, and the bloke said to Pat, this geezer, he went, listen, mate, you're doing 20 years. You've got to stand up for yourself and make an example, or you're going to have the piss took out of you throughout your bird. So the geezers took his advice. So we get opened up for um, association, Black geezer runs in the shower, there's a black geezer in there, stabs the life out of him. So I'll go in the shower afterwards, he disappears, the geezer's stabbed up in the thing. I just pick the knife up, snap the knife, it's gone, right? Now the bells are gone, the geezer's it's been, now the old prison, the old wing is screaming the gaff down. Pat's come out of the town, right? <laughs> And it was the first time I thought, this kid's a fucking lunatic. He went, come on. So I went, oh, I'm there I am. So I follow him. He's going up the stairs. Well, all the blacks are on the top floor. They're all trying to come down. The screws are trying to hold them back. He's standing there in a towel with me on his shoulder. Come on, man. Screaming on his own with me and him. And I'm thinking, take me back to Wandsworth. I want to go back to one. It was fucking mad. We come down, they bang us all up, let us out for association. We go into Joe's cell. And he's, I can talk about these people because Joe's no longer with us, another one. I walk into his cell, so he's sitting there, he went, right. What we do, this is him talking in Greek, I think. What we do, we do this. He's got a flower pot with little plastic flowers sitting on the side. He picked the flower pot up, tips it upside down. I think, what's he doing? He's grabbed something else from here, something else, and he's grabbed this thing out from under his box with a blade like that. And he's gone click, 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 click. He's made a fucking, he's made a bang it. Out of the things, it was already prepared to go. You just had to put it together. So he must have been something, some secret agent or something. And he just put his, he put his tea towel over his arm, right? Got the blade. He went, let's go downstairs. And I'm thinking to myself, oh, mate, I've been here two days. This guy's now going to go and stab someone to death. But he didn't, luckily. But Joe was another one I ended up visiting in prison. Because he kept cutting screws and causing chaos. So I thought, if maybe if I visit him, calm him down, he gets a visitor, and I'll become his, uh, one of his best visitors. And what a lovely man. What a nice man. I know it sounds mad. He's someone... They went to arrest him. I think it was Tony Lundy, and they was arresting him for a robbery. And this is how scared of him they was. They had observation on an house, and they weren't sure he was in it. And he come out the house, and they were standing on a corner, and they knew it was Joe, and this is in their book. We knew it was Joe, but we pretended we didn't see him. They blanked it. That's, the, that's how brave they was. They turned their way because they didn't want to deal with him. He was an handful, Joe. But that gives you an insight into... Albany was a madass, mate. What's the worst thing you've seen in prison, Paul? 
there's always people getting stabbed, jug, or water cut, you know. It's probably, um, it's not even, a, you don't actually look at it like that. It just happens. It just happens. Yeah, I don't know, For me, the worst time, the worst situation with me was going from Albany, there was a problem in the workshop to do with, you know, the bloke who got nicked for the um, Lynn and Megan Russell murders, mm -hmm. Michael Stone. I don't believe he's guilty at all, right? He's in the workshop. Little little situation evolves. He gets up. He clumps the um, who's in charge of the workshop, the civilian instructor. The bell goes off. So the screws will come flying in. Pat takes charge again. Pushes the kid in the office. We stand in front of the office. We're not letting him in. So it's me, Pat, and another geezer. It's commotion. And he went, you ain't coming in here and you ain't fucking taking him, right? And shit again, it's me and him standing there. Anyway, next morning, they don't take him, but we get a guarantee that he's not going to get bashed up. Gone. Next morning, they come in over dinner, get your gear packed. Well, not get your gear packed. Come on. I had a little box under the bed with sugar and that in. I'm on a van. Pat gets him slung on a van. He goes to Winston Green. I get on a van. I'm going to Dorchester, Exeter. Swansea and Cardiff, all over Christmas. I'm getting abused from all the Welsh cons and as they took me down to get paid, they're throwing things at me. And that was like, that weren't a good bit of bird because that's lonely. You're in the block, on your own, G-O-A-D. And it was just, yeah, it was a fucker. It was a fucker. But I think I've, I, some of the stories, when I get into them and I think about them, like Wandsworth, a friend of mine, Jacko, he's another one. All these people I'm mentioning, they're not there no more. Jacko, he's, he's had a row of a geezer in the cell. So I said, listen, don't go in the cell. He goes in the cell. The geezer does what he does because the geezer can, he can box this geezer, proper boxer. So in the morning, I come out. I go down to the up plate. He's giving out a tube, a metal tube. I get right, dip your, your mug in, you get your tea. So I walk, walk down to the, um, the up plate. So I've got me breakfast. So I went, I'm going to put this in the hot plate while I go. And that's how I'm talking to him. So I'm letting him know that I'm not going to do nothing. And I'm going over there, right? And he's just looking at me. I put the plate in, stood up. And he went, bang, right? He's done me. I've hit the fence. And it's all I could hear screaming. Paul, get up, Paul, get up, do him, do him. And I remember jumping up. I grabbed the tea bucket off the floor and flung the hot tea over him. Done him with the tea. Swung the bucket and the screws on my shoulder. And I beat him straight in the face to screw with a bucket. And I know I'm now going to get bashed right up. And as I hit him with a bucket, I thought, oh, fucking hell. And they just, well, they just bashed you up and flung you down the stairs, flung me in the, down the cell in the block. And I remember I got down, there was about five people down there, all long-termers, and they all want to shit up. And I could smell it, and I was, all I was thinking, ah, oh, please, please don't ask me to get involved in this one. I went in the cell, they went, here, yeah, mate. And I'm thinking, drop me out. He went, who is it? I said, it's Paul Sarsa. So hey, you, mate, you all right? What's happening? Blah, blah, blah. When you go and shit, if you go to the toilet, be careful of the door, because it's covered in shit as you open the toilet door. I went, listen, I'll be in this if you want me to be in it. They went, nah, listen, you'll be down here for a month, you'll be back on the wing. He said, we've been down every year. Why you got to put yourself through that? I thought, thank you. That's all I wanted to hear. I went, you sure? I went, yeah, no, go on, where you go. Yeah, and that was, I think I've done a month, a month remission with a board of visitors for that. Because it was an accident and fucking hell. Wandsworth was tough, mate. Tough prison. But it was the best bird. Chelmsford, another, another great prison. We had a fucking laugh in Chelmsford. We had a laugh. It's crazy when you think you had a laugh. It's funny. Sometimes that's all you can do in crazy circumstances is fucking laugh it off. Who's the maddest part that you've ever been across, came across? I would probably have to say Joe the Greek because he would, he would kill you. He would just kill you. That's my opinion. Yeah. Yeah. Pat, Pat, double cone. Double cone. And he was. 
Yeah, he must have been, man. He fucking shot you and, and talking about the prison stories, he sounded right up for it. Listen, he was in in the eighties, he was like Yeah, he was he was on fire. He was on fire. But that's why I thought he didn't have to be on fire, because then I could I could do that for you. You ain't here no more. And he was he was in Spain and he was just being normal. As I said to you before, when I come out of prison, he was a completely different person. He was all calm and relaxed and he was in a good place. Yeah, we've had a good journey. We've had an um, eventful life, I suppose you'd say. Do you get emotional over it, Paul? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, because it's, it's, quite, it's quite sad that something could... Um, I told you, I've got, I've got a tail across my chest and this is, I think I do this just all, every day. I don't know why I do it to myself. Sometimes the man you take a bullet for ends up being the one behind the gun, right? And it's like, that's every, every morning I look in the mirror and see that. And it's just a reminder, not that I need a reminder, but it's just a reminder how things can change and think people can turn. You got that before you got shot? No, after. Yeah, it'd have been a bit of a fucking coincidence, that, wouldn't it? Oh, could... that would have been, yeah, that would have been terrible. Are you going to keep that tattoo? Yeah. Yeah, I've got that one now and I've got another one. I've never been into toes. And the other one is, Lord, we ain't a word, it's a way of life. And for me, it is. It is a way of life. I don't know how to be any other way. What was it like actually getting shot, Paul? Did you feel as if you were going to die at any point? Yeah. Yeah, I thought I was gone. Without any shadow of a doubt. I thought, you're gone here, mate. You're gone. And I just, as I said, I just laid on my back, trying to control my breathing, because I know if I start, I think I'm pumping out of blood, but I ain't. There's no blood. So I'm thinking this is pumping, I've got to calm myself down. All my first thought was throw the phone, because I've had it in my hand, little knocky. I thought throw that down the drain. There's a bit of evidence there that it affects other people, not me. So what I mean, I'm fucking, I'm, I'm, I'm laying here, I'm trying to protect people still. Yeah, I thought I was dying. Yeah, I thought I was, yeah, I thought I was dying. But I'll assure you one thing, it ain't scary. It wasn't scary at all. It was calm. It was really calm. It was almost serene. It was a serene sort of, yeah, it was strange. Most people, you you think people would over, oh, no, I don't, no. It was calm. It's probably shock. But yeah, I was calm. It's mad that though, because the only motivation you genuinely should need in life is that you are going to die someday. And mm. I've been in rooms when people have died, loved ones, great grandparents, yeah. great uncles, seen my dad dying, but, but they never scream no. in pain. They never scream for help that they want to be here. They go in peace. As soon as they take their last breath, it's like, it's like a relief. It is, isn't it? Strange. So that for me gives me confidence that there's something better. Whether there is something else out there, I believe that there genuinely could be something better where they're not worried about it. They just go. It ain't scary. And it's where no. it's like when you see the last breath comes, it's like a relief. It is so strange. Because this is a fucked up place we're in, Paul. This is hell, isn't it? It's fucked up. There's a lot of beautiful things when you when I'm in Scotland and I see the scenery in the lakes and I go, like, the earth is a beautiful place, but when you actually come into the game and hmm. hear stories, you realise how fucked up the human mind can be in some yeah. people. And it doesn't have to be that way, and that's what breaks my heart in life. The world can be such an amazing place, but it just seems a wee bit in turmoil and everybody's confused. They're kind of in a rat race, trying to, not enjoying it as the way they should be. Everyone's chasing that dollar, isn't they? That money seems to be the... It, listen, it is a major part of your life, but you can't let it be your god. That can't be yours. Everything's about getting money, getting money, and then what? Then what do you, that's what I say to these kids. What are you going to do when you get it? Leave it under the bed. Leave it at someone's house, and then they'll dip it in it, and they'll nick it. And it, it's never your money. What's the point? I'd rather have all my friends from when I grew up as kids. Two of them are just, well, 
two of them, well, one of them, he's got multiple sclerosis. I've got a lot of respect for that man because he fights this illness he's got with a smile on his face. And he laughs and he just, everything's, and I look at him and he's, he's, had a, he's, he's got a good life. He's never committed enough, no crime in his life. He's happy. He's got his kids, he's, he's, he's completely happy. And most of my friends are. And the other one, he's a school teacher. He's a, he's a really got amazing job. And he, he's, he, he don't even realize, but, and I don't, I, don't, I don't know how to word this, but he lost his wife about a year ago, which was like absolutely devastating for him and his family and everyone who knew her. But when I say to describe my, my, the pain I go through as a broken heart, and then when I was at that funeral, that word I used, I'm demeaning it. Because that's when I saw what a broken heart was. And it's like, that makes me go cold now. Because it just, it... it and he, he, out of all my friends, them two, I respect. Because he, he changed his life. Become a really respected teacher. All these kids love him. All these, all the people he works with love him. And my other mate, as I said. Yeah, this, all my friends who I went to school with, all work for a living. And live the same life as I did. If not better. Because their doors ain't going to come in. They're not going to get stabbed or shot or whatever. They live their life. So you can, that's what I say to these kids, you can have all the things that all these other people's got. You might have to work for it though. Don't go out and try to be a drug dealer and do, get yourself an education, get a trade behind you. You've got something to fall back on. What did I have to fall back on? Nothing, nothing. I had no skills. I was like, and that's when it, it, it came to me. I thought, well, you've got lived experience here. You've been through most of what these kids are going through now. And that's why when I sit there, I'll put it, I'll put it on the table with them now. Don't hide now. I'll say, listen, there's nothing that you kids ain't been through or going through that I ain't been through. And I'll tell them, I've been abused. I've had this happen, that happen, that happen. I've been shot, blah, blah, blah. And they're like, I ain't got too many excuses, have they? Because I've given them everything to sort of work with. Well, I'll get, oh yeah, I'll get great pleasure with that. Let's talk about the positives you're doing with your life now since everything you've been through to the things you've worked on with the therapy, speaking in schools, going in prisons. Like, let's talk about all the positives and the changes that you've made, Paul. When did you see it all starting to change for you and taking a turn for the best? Honestly, I, two years ago, I started doing the things in the schools and it's changing lives. And then about a year ago, no, 18 months ago, I got this on this panel. It don't pay nothing, it's voluntary, all of it. But it gives me, it's, it's all positive. It's all positive. And then I'm doing something with this, with this, with this other place, which is called um, Training 360 in conjunction with RIS. And that's at the Olympic Park. It's about getting kids the um, CSS cards. So I don't go into the industry of building Trained. and blah, but train the trade, yeah. And um, yeah, that it, there's there's four or five things that's all going on that are all good. They're all about doing what I like, helping again. But for the right reasons. For the right reasons, yeah. I don't there's, I don't get involved in anything no more. I may sit down and now and again ask someone to ask me, will you sit down with someone and do a bit of negotiating or something? Then, yeah, I don't mind doing that. But don't ask me to get involved in anything to do with drugs. Don't want to negotiate with anyone to do with... I don't want to know about all that nonsense. That's, that's not for me. That's not for me. I can't even think the name of the, the 360... I'll oh, forget it anyway. But that's in Basman. So everything I'm doing is really in Essex. In Essex, yeah, and this, if I can carry on like I am, helping people with drugs, getting them out of drink, and just mental health, all these good things that I've been through, then I've got something to offer. I'm not an out-of-work, useless ex-criminal. 
Because I, I, one thing I've never described myself as a gangster, and as you said it, as a tough man. But I've been in tough situations, and there is times when I've had to act the part and be the part and play the part and deliver. That's just, we're all wearing masks, isn't we? That's what you've hit the nail on the head. It's playing the part. We're all playing the part. Oh, an, an acting game. Like, I've seen people who portray themselves as lunatics, fucking lunatics. I know them personally. They would never fucking say boot a ghost, but because of that certain persona that they carry, exactly. they've got, you know yourself, if somebody walks into a room, you go, he's got it. But people genuinely, once you actually get to know him, you realise he's full yeah. of shit. Man. The loud ones usually ain't got it. Yeah, nah, they're full they're of acting. shit. Yeah. The loud, you know yourself, the louder ones are, but there's ones that have got that walk, who've got that persona and that. Presence. Yeah, okay, right. I, I know not to fuck with you. I know you're, a, you're the real deal. Yeah. But you tend to see as a, when you're a kid and you grow up, you think it's the boys, just ones, the loud ones, the fucking. But that's what you think. Yeah, it's crazy like how your mindset does change as the yeah. years go on. And that's okay because we can be different people who we were a year ago, a month ago, 20 years ago. It's just everybody goes through different stages in life. Yeah. But it's just trying to work out are you making positive changes or negative changes? And that's what it comes down to to try and figure out are you bringing some goodness into the world? Plans for the future, Paul, where do you see yourself? I'm just going to carry on as I am. I'm going to carry on, listen, 61. You look great, by the way. I've got to lose a stone or two. I need to lose two, mate. I've fucked killer, two it? stone on. I'll, but the thing with me, I know I lose it. Easy. So I, I give myself that extra few pounds on, but I've let it slip more than I should have. i will back out running again just two weeks ago, so I'll take about four weeks to get a stone off. It's diet, isn't it? We know it's it eating, is. mate. Comfort eating. Can't, and that's what I eat on my feelings. I always do. I'm the same. That's my one vice I struggle with. But I know I will master it. I always say I will hit my peak and my prime in my 40s and 50s. Because all the knowledge that I have, it will, will come together. I hope so. And I, I'm a man who likes to believe in what I say. And I tend to go out and do what I say. So I want to lead by example. This man's changed his life. He's in his 40s. He's fucking peak condition. He's still doing his things. He's still raising the bar. If he can do it, I can do it. And that's what I say about myself now. I think I'm in the place where I'm meant to be. That's where I'm, I'm in the position I'm meant to be in. As I said, I ain't got no loads, loads of money, but I've got enough to pay my bills. This job allows me not to have to worry about the bills. That's a big problem off my back. So it don't that way I ain't sort of sucked into something. It's not happening. Yeah. I owe it to my family. I owe it to my wife and kids. Most importantly, though, kids. most importantly, though, Paul, you owe it to yourself. And that's what it all comes down to as well, because we forget that. But that's something I've never done. I never put my feelings. I always put everyone else's feelings above my own. And I've always done that. I, I don't know why. It's just part of... Oh, James, I don't know why. It's... <laughs> I don't know why, because I, I ask the question all the time. Yeah. Why do you do that? I was, when this this counsellor, she went to me, Paul, what are you proud of what you've done in your life? And I went, nothing really, nothing to be proud of. And then she went, what, nothing? I said, no. I said, do you actually, I'll tell you the one thing I'm proud of is, and I know, because I do, I usually use this all the time because it's my only thing I can, the rowing machine in the gym. I love the rowing machine. And I worked on it for to do an under three hours marathon, right? That ain't easy. You've been on the row? Yeah. Right, three hours. And I've done it in under three hours, two hours, 57 minutes. And the pride I felt from that was unbelievable. Because also I'm on the concept too, I'm sort of six in this country and the time. And I thought, that ain't bad. That ain't bad. So I've done that. A lot of people say you've been off drugs now for 14 years. You've got to be proud of that. But I don't see that. I see that as something that shouldn't have happened in the first place. I allowed that to get out of control. I allowed that to happen, right? So that ain't something to be proud of. You're doing what you should have been doing. There ain't, there ain't a lot else. There ain't a lot else. There's that. What else is there? I'm proud that I, I stood. I'm proud how I conducted myself as a friend. I'm proud how I conducted myself after being shot because there's a lot of people out there, mate, would have rolled over. One million percent, they would have rolled just down to fear. Because 
pride in doing what was right when I come into it. So I'm proud of that. It's probably my proudest thing that I took it like a man and still stood up and I'm still a man and I still live by my rules. I'm proud of that. I'm proud of my own integrity as a man. Yeah, there's lots of things you should be proud of, Paul, and I'm proud of you to call you a friend. For anybody that's watching that's maybe battling with addiction just now, what advice would you have for them? Go to a meeting. It's as simple as that. It's the only advice you can give them. Go to a meeting. You've got to start off somewhere. Go to an AA meeting, CA meeting, AA, whatever you want to go to, but go to a meeting. You've got to start somewhere. You've got to make that first step. If you make that first step, you'll find there's a lot of love in them rooms, which is something that I didn't didn't get. But there is. You know there is. Yeah, because these people... You're all the same. Been for 30, 40 years, and that's why people message me and I say, get to a meeting, whether it's A, yeah, you've said GA, the NA, is go to a meeting and you can understand that you're not alone because we bottle everything up, we hide it all, we feel exactly ashamed, right. we feel not worthy, we're depressed, so we hide it, hide it, hide it, but you keep hiding it, it just, it just blows takes... your head off. What do people usually say? Nah, but I might know someone there. <laughs> They're in it for the same reason as you. Use it. People are embarrassed. It is, listen, it's the most hardest thing to walk in one of the meetings. Yeah. And it's... It's horrible. It is horrible. I still get nervous sometimes. I get from time to time just to get a wee bit of medicine and keep me on the straight and narrow. Just don't yeah, forget it. yourself. Because it's just good to know that phew, it can fucking turn because there's people been at these meetings for 20 years and relapsed. Listen, I, I, I'm going to tell you another quick story. This is a crazy one. So I'm, on, I'm, I'm been doing the crack. My friend comes around. He said, listen, Paul, it's time you went somewhere. So I went, I'm all right. I look like a crackhead, right? But because I'm in a nice ass and I've got nice things, I'm not a crackhead, am I? So he went, anyway, gives me a number of place called Barley Wood. So they, they take me there quite a moment. Anyway, long story short. And then a couple of days. This geezer comes in, he's relapsed. 20 years he's been clean, and he's a counsellor. He's had a rabbi's wife, and he's relapsed. So they went, he come over, he went, all right, mate, he said, yeah, I'm from, he started cracking names. Now, don't forget, I've only been here a couple of days. Yeah, copper, plant. Straight away he's a plant, I'm on the phone. Listen, find out if so-and-so, now I'm in, in that zone now, I'm in the prison zone. Find out if you know so-and-so now. Comes back, don't know him. Yep, he's definitely a cover. This geezer goes up to bed. I've made a big ooh about this. You've got a cover in, he's a plant, and blah, blah, blah. No, he's not. I can vouch for him. Nah, he's a plant. Next morning, I'm still on it. I'm still saying it. He comes in to me, went, Paul, let me tell you now, he's not a plant. Trust me. I said, I don't believe you. He said, well, he's upstairs in bed dead. He's not a plant. He's dead. Down to the relapse. Now, he's 20 years clean. He's got on the vodka, got on the snip, and he's had a relapse and died, right? My version is, no, you're covering it up now. This is, the paranoia was overwhelming. And he said, and before you ask me your next question, no, you can't have a look at his body. Because that's what my next question was going to be. Can I have a look at his body? He went, but I'll tell you what to do. Wait at the back door. They're bringing him out in about half hour. And he's died. He died in there. I felt terrible. Now I've got to walk around and shame on the man. He's called this guy who's just died a copper and he ain't. Did you see his body actually getting took Yeah, I've seen see something to the ambulance thing. No, 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 it's covered over. It could have been a plant, but... No, he was. He, he was, he was <laughs> genuinely... It seems a bit sus as well. It was. It stunk. I was still thinking about yeah. that. Unless I'd seen his face going out, you think, nah. Because that's how fucking good they are. If you've called him out straight away, yeah. first thing to do is get his body out. But you know, they wouldn't... They don't do them things. The cosa can come in there as a plant, but they're not going to allow that because mm -hmm. that destroys that whole privacy thing. Yeah, they? you can't use any of that against you, but you know yourself, the coppers can still bug you. They can oh, still get their intelligence we're, that they need to catch you. They can't use it in court, but we know how the fucking law operate. If you're being yeah, bad, they're going to catch you. The bugs are like, the, the way they're nicking people now, it's like... Yeah, they're in cruel chat. Yeah. Mate. But for people you even use the name, it's just, I'm surprised. Yeah, but I'm surprised that these so-called people that are really intelligent have been at it for years, and now they're taking someone's word that these things can't be at. They can't get that's, into that's, them. I can't, but I get that, my head around that. I find it amazing. People talking some heavy shit as well. No sort of code. Yeah. Blatant. Yeah. 
I've seen people to get some proper bird down to them. Yeah, proper so, bird. Know, cheers, but I think that with the French, the France thing, I think it's there's a lot of shit apparently getting turned. So I, I think they'll know. overturn a lot of it. Yeah, but there's still a lot of people being sent, so I don't know if they'll get their sentence overturned. I'm not sure how it works. I'm going. I will do a big podcast on it once that. Once the birds, you've done the bird, it don't matter if it's over. Yeah. It's done. What about anybody that's wanted to get involved in a life of crime, Paul? You've lived that, man. You've been at the top of the tree. What advice would you have for them, for any of those young kids watching? Don't. No. No. Let me tell you now. It's full of betrayal, treachery, and greed. That's all it consists of. There's no real love in there. You think there is, but there ain't no real love. You can get you get flung under the bus as soon as it suits with anyone. All right, you might find one or two people that are that are genuine and but really everyone's after the same thing. They want the same dollar. They're all but most of these people, they're running around with drugs, right? They now describe themselves as gangsters, right? Because they're running around with a boat full of drugs. They get 20 years if they get nicked. Put a gun in their hand. No, they won't do that. All right, a lot of these kids today will just stab you up. You know what they do, they ain't gonna fuck about. But these these kids are getting caught up in situations that are just, they set up, take a parcel, get robbed. Now you're a slave. Now you've got to work for us forever. That's how it works. Don't get done, don't. You get as much money as you want working for a living and without any of the headaches. For coming on today, Paul, listen, like I said, for the last three years, we've always been in contact. I think what you're doing is amazing. I'm proud of you, everything you've done to then make the changes and try and kick on and, and do the right things in life. Would you like to finish up on anything? There was a, there was a, I was going to talk about a young kid that, that um, another, how many people have I said killed himself? It was a young kid called Lee. This happened in 19, no, 19, 2007. He was in trouble from Spain. He owed some money to people. He wasn't a criminal. He was a runner. And he took 200 grand to have a gear off someone to drop it off. He'd give it to someone. He got fucked. So I get the phone call. Listen, do you know this firm? Blah, 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 blah. I know his father-in-law. Paul, see if you can find out what he's done with this. I'll get over to this kid, get him around my house. This is another one I don't feel good about. He comes to me, I sat him down, I said, right, listen, you know this has got to be resolved. Yeah, I know it'll be done. This is like, he's in his late 20s, got a little baby just been born. A nice, nice kid. So I said, who's the fella? So he gives me the name. I said, right, well, you meant, but no, it's going to be done on Monday. So I said, if you don't, I'm going to have to, I've got to come and see you to get this sorted out there. It's got to be done. He went, all right, I'll see you Monday. This is on Sunday afternoon. Went home and hung yourself. Number one, right? And it was like, for fuck's sake. Why have you, you that's fear that's done that to him. Fear, and it went out, this, this bloke did have him over and we had him set up in this, what we done, we had him sort of arrange someone was gonna get him to a flat because he'd been bullying someone. So what I'd done, I took, I said to the bloke, look, I'll get this sorted out for you, but you've got to put 25 on the table. All right, so I took 25 grand off the geezer. Didn't take it at the time. I said, once it's resolved. So he went, that'll do me. So with this geezer who's nicked the 200 grand, is going to turn up at the flat and we're going to deal with the situation. So that's how we're going. I'm in a restaurant with my wife. Sitting in there. Someone rings up. Can I see you? So I said, yeah, go on. Smell. This is, this is sad because this fella was only trying to do the right thing, right? He was trying to do what I would have done. And he went, look, you know the situation? So I said, yeah, he went, I fucked it up. So I said, what do you mean you fucked it up? What are you, what are you talking about? I've got it in, under control tomorrow morning. He's going to go to the flat. No, but what I've done, I've got the geezer to rearrange it for today. He said, I've gone on him. I've ended up shooting him in the leg, right? And he's escaped. And now the police have got him in witness protection. So we not only this kid has killed himself, we've lost 200 grand. We ain't, but the people have lost 200 grand. He's gone and hung himself. This has been fucked right up. 
and I'll give the kid 15 grand out of 25 grand for fucking it up. That's because he still tried. He still was doing it for the right thing. He didn't do it for, for anything other than trying to prove himself. And I, I respected him for trying it, but also felt sorry for him. And I'll give him his fucking 15 grand like he was a nit man. And then he started telling him when he was a nit man. And I didn't I talk to him, I'm with a kid, but what a crazy thing to do. But yeah, another one. I can't believe how many people I've spoke to have all took their own life. Society you now, man, I don't know, social media plays a big part, addiction plays a big part, yeah. fear of not being good enough, fear of letting other people down, just not able to work in yourself. A lot of testosterone's down the men, they say men have become weaker, and it's not weaker to be suicidal, but just weaker in a whole, that they're just not going to the gym, they're not exercising, they're not finding purpose. That all comes with exercise and eating good and, and keeping a clean space up here where you'll find that some strength to then try and do something new. If you're taking drink, if you're taking drugs, if you're sex addiction, if you're fucking gambling, if you're feeling sorry for yourself, if you're not exercising, you ain't going to have the strength to then kick on and try and make better changes in your life. Nah, to eliminate sure. the negatives that you're doing to try and become a better person. When you get the strength, then you have some inner strength to then kick on and try and create something yeah. special with your life yeah. and just staying on that path because it's difficult. We all have fallouts. We still get angry. We still make bad decisions. But it's to be true to you and remember, you're not on this planet to be a fuck up and a loser or a bum that... You can be something special no matter what age you are. People change in their 60s or 70s or 80s. It's never too late to change and that's what people need to understand. Again, brother, would you like to finish up on anything? As I say, the only thing I would, I would finish up on when you're talking about the mental health, if you've got problems with drugs, mental health, or you've got a drama going on in your head, people don't know about this drama unless you talk about it. You can't be scared to talk to people. You can't be scared to share a drama because I, I can talk about things now, no problem. And I, yeah, speak to someone. Don't don't just um, don't take your life or put yourself in a situation. If you're in debt for a situation, someone can always help you out because talking can be can sort out most problems. It don't have to be about violence. You can talk about it and you can come to a resolution. If you owe people money, people want their money. They don't want to do you and not get their money. So if you can sit down and you can say something like, I can give you X amount or blah, people are happy with that. So just think before you act, I think. Oh, well, listen, nothing but love and respect Thanks, for you, mate. mate. I wish you all the best for the future. Thank you. Keep doing what you're doing. Thanks, mate.